begin next Thursday, next week, will be our last colloquium. The speaker will talk about collaborative, cooperative robots. Apparently, you are going to have friends in the robotic business. So that's next week. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Sergio, the Argentinian Argentinian Sergio Bazzolini from the University of California, San Francisco, where we will explain to us what is big data. So let's welcome our speaker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Letting, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to uh, talk to you uh, today. It's Although I've been living in San Francisco for almost 20 years, it's my first time visiting Sonoma State. So um, as you can uh, grasp from the title and from the place I'm coming from, um, this will have a distinct biologically uh, oriented flavor to the computation. Nevertheless, I hope that you will be able to take uh, home certain points that I will uh, make uh, as to the importance of data integration and analysis to solve big problems, and in my case, the kind of big problems that I'm interested in are health-related. So I'm going to talk a lot about uh, back and forth uh, how we can approach these uh, issues, and I'm going to be mentioning uh, uh, along this, the, the lines a, a few um, uh, items related to biology. If at any point what I'm saying doesn't make a lot of sense or even a little bit of sense, raise your hand and I'll be willing to go back and explain it to you. Uh, the point is that uh, I would like really to, uh, to communicate. So let me start with a slide that I show uh, pretty much in every talk that I give because I think it's so central to everything that we do. And this has to do with the hierarchical organization of uh, biological complexity. And most people will agree that if you start from the bottom up in terms of how the information flows to create or to uh, 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 evolve um, complex uh, uh, um, living organisms, you can start all the way down from the genomic information, so the genome. And here I added the metagenome, which corresponds to the genome of all those bacteria and viruses that live within and around us. So later on, as most of you will know or you remember from, from your high school biology, DNA will transcribe into RNA, so you will have an, an expression of those genes. So the genes are turning on and off based on certain rules, which we still don't understand fully. Those uh, uh, intermediates, those RNA molecules within the cell, will then translate into proteins, and proteins can be seen as the basic blocks of life. Uh, and proteins interact in many ways uh, and forming very, very complex networks. Those uh, uh, networks of proteins are then assembled into pathways that are the basic communication uh, avenue for a cell to interpret its surroundings. So this uh, biological pathways are key to anything that a cell does from division to dying to responding to the external uh, environment. Then, of course, uh, a cell integrates all that information. Cells are great integrators of information, and they can cope with, they can compute an incredibly large number of, uh, of, of data and signals and uh, produce an output in a very, very predictable way. The problem is that we still don't understand exactly how cells work. And then we have a, a, an arbitrary number of, 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 of uh, if you will, uh, stages. Cells assemble into tissues, tissues assemble into systems, and then all the way up you have the organism. Now, one of the big problems that uh, I think uh, we as, uh, as, as researchers have been facing is that each of these stages are being studied in isolation. So here you have the geneticists that actually are trying to make an infer inference about how the genome is uh, changing or how each of us are different at the genomic level and trying to correlate all the way up here with a phenotype. And a phenotype is anything 
from one person being blonde and the other not, to one person having freckles and the other not, and one person having diabetes and the other not. So, um, but in, in genetic analysis, and this is something that we do a lot, we are bypassing all this uh, information. So we're just associating statistically variation all the way down here with variation all the way up there. And with any other of these fields, it happens the same thing. So here you have molecular biologists starting to understand how uh, the, the genes could turn on and off. Here you have cell biologists trying to understand how cells communicate to each other. Here you have biochemists, biochemists trying to understand how uh, proteins uh, interact. But then there's very little integration across. And the point that I'm trying to make is that by integrating different uh, sources of data, one could get a much better picture of what's happening biologically. Okay. And now data is available, now data is cheap and even free. So that's a fantastic opportunity for uh, uh, data scientists to, to tap into that resource. So one example of what we can do once we get our hands on data uh, is illustrated in this very simple uh, movie. Here, what I'm showing you are, if one could get our hands into all the genetic information that is available for all diseases that we know of, one can start to make uh, uh, this kind of things. So imagine that these are diseases and these here are genes. So if we have all the genes that contribute to the susceptibility of all these diseases, and some diseases here are colored green, meaning they are immune diseases in nature. Some diseases are in red, those are neurological diseases. If we put G's, many diseases and genes together, we can start to see patterns of similarity across diseases. And here you can see that there's a big, big cluster of autoimmune diseases because and the reason why they cluster is because they share a lot of susceptibility genes. And now I'm reclustering the top seven most common autoimmune diseases, and then we're focusing again, zooming in back in, in zooming back in at these three diseases that are the most common autoimmune diseases: multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes, and rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that they share lots and lots of susceptibility genes. So this was simply not possible 15 years ago because we didn't have the data uh, and people were focusing on their own disease or on their own favorite gene and their own favorite protein. So now we can do things like this and fortunately the, the projection is not great but it's a similar uh, plot where you can construct a, g a disease gene network and you can start to identify again similarities across diseases in the graph uh, uh, format and sometimes graphs allow you for data interpretation that is not simply possible with regular statistical uh, um, uh, methods. So for example, these are again the seven most common autoimmune diseases and here we're zooming in. In some of those genes, the little triangles are genes that are associated to, to these diseases and these white uh, edges here represent key genes. Those are genes that are master regulators. And you see that there's an enrichment of those in this uh, as what would be expected by chance. This is highly statistically significant. The point is by looking at multiple data sources at once, you can get insights into a particularly complex problem. So if we look only at the genes or the proteins encoded by those genes that, have known to, that are known to be associated with uh, these diseases, you can start to get uh, a pattern of how they are connected in protein uh, space. So a lot of these proteins interact and, and they, they bind to each other and by binding to each other they can exchange information, they can change one, one another. So learning which proteins bind to which proteins and whether they come from a uh, gene that has been associated with the susceptibility to that disease gives us a lot of information about the networks of those genes and what are the key cellular mechanisms that are at play in the susceptibility to common diseases. So that's a, a basic uh, uh, aspect of what I'm talking about. So. Uh, this word, have you ever seen this word before, GWAS? So this is a, a, a word that stands for Genome-Wide Association Study. So this is a very, very common way to uh, study how 
genes are involved in the susceptibility to common diseases. And essentially what we do is we uh, study typically thousands of uh, patients with a given disease and we study their DNA, we study the variation in those nucleotides of the DNA that are fairly common that makes all of us different and we compare the variation that we see in a group of patients to the variation that we see to a group of healthy controls. And we look for the differences. And the way we have to do that is statistically very dumb. We do that one by one. This is a boring, tedious, now with computers it's much faster, but still is a one by one. So this plot, which is called a Manhattan plot, for obvious reasons, this um, depicts the statistical association, the statistical uh, strength of association of each, each of these dots is one DNA marker across the genome. And they're sorted by chromosome. And overall, there's half a million in this figure. And we do half a million tests. For the given marker, we test, is the frequency of this particular DNA marker different, statistically different between our group of cases and our group of controls. If it is different, that's a significant p-value because this is minus log 10 of that, the, the uh, SNP will be, or the, the, the dot will be high up here. So according to this, well, you will say here, there's something interesting in the genome that's in chromosome six, p-value 10 to the minus 81. That's fairly certain that there's something in there and actually we know in chromosome six, the histocompatibility system is encoded. The histocompatibility system is our part of the immune system that tell our body what is ours and what is not ours so that they can mount an appropriate immune response. This disease, in this case, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease, so it makes a lot of sense that variation in that region of the genome that modulates our immune response might be involved in the susceptibility. So, the problem is that we're doing half a million uh, comparisons here. So when one does this many uh, hypotheses, uh, when one tests this many hypotheses, you have to co correct for that, right? So you cannot test, uh, if, you, if you test 100 hypotheses, then by chance, probably uh, five of them will be significant at the 0 0.05 level. That's what you would expect. So here, you'll do the same. You have to correct for the half a million hypotheses. Then the new threshold after correction becomes some, somewhere around this uh, dotted line. So if you eliminate all of these variants that uh, did not reach that up significance, then that's it. You're only led, left with, with this signal. So what we and others uh, hypothesized is that, well, maybe there is some signal hiding uh, below this threshold and because statistically we cannot trust them be because they might be type 1 errors, false, false positive errors, we uh, simply discard them. So there's an alternative by saying, well, maybe there's some variants here in the gene encoded in chromosome 1 along with some variant here in the gene encoded in chromosome 10 and along with another variant here in chromosome 20 that are in genes that actually play together. So they are part of a module, imagine, in, in the cell. So if we get, and they're not independent. So if we can merge the evidence of statistical association, even at lower threshold, to the evidence of physical interaction, so if we know that those genes encode proteins that interact, maybe we can rescue those and they, they could be important. So the problem typically in the G was, is that how do you know that something that is reported is not a false positive? And everything could seem like interesting if you don't do the appropriate corrections. So this is a fairly complicated figure. So it's a power calculation. Um, the, one, the one thing that I would like to mention about this is that depending on your sample size of the study, you can trust or not your results better or not. So for example, if you have a sample size of 1,000 patients, even though if you have a p-value of 10 to the minus eight, that is basically the log, uh, the, uh, the, the log of the odds ratio is basically one. 
So the, the logarithm of that is zero, meaning you're almost likely, equally likely to be true than false. Because even though that p-value is fairly significant, there are chances that that may be a false positive. And if you compare that to a sample size double that size, 2,000, the same p-value gives you already 10 times more likely to be true than false. And if you have a, a 10 to the minus 8 with 10,000 individuals, well, that's about 1,000 a, a times more likely to be true than false. So this is an important uh, aspect when one tries to, to, to do this kind of a study. The problem here is that, as you see, all of them start from all the way down here, which is the prior uh, hypothesis. So the, the prior probability that a given gene in the genome is associated with a particular disease is set to 10 to the minus 5 for all of, the, of them. What we're trying to say is that, well, not really, because there's biology. So it's not only statistics, there's also biology that not every gene in the genome has a priori the same probability, because some genes might be acting on pathways involved in immunology and in, in, in immunity. So those are perhaps uh, should be lifted. So what we're trying to say is that if you add biology, maybe you can lift that prior probability for all of them. So then you can get away with better information for your sample size. And this is illustrated here as a, as a toy problem. Imagine that each of this um, <coughs> uh, uh, rows here represents <coughs> a given patient, and each of the columns represents variation in a given gene. Then if you have, if an, a particular individual has the black dot here, means that, okay, that is associated with the disease, and if it's white, it's not associated. For most of this, except for the region in chromosome six that I showed you, that it was a huge peak, the reason why it was a huge peak is because most patients will have the black uh, uh, dot here. That's why it is associated. Problem is that for most other genes, then the the, the evidence is not that strong. <coughs> Except that if you think that in a subset of the patients, they may have variation in this gene, this gene, this gene, and this gene, and they happen to be part of the same pathway. Similarly, another set of patients may have variants in genes that are part of a different pathway, and so on. So no given gene will be significant in everyone. That's why the p-value will be iffy but maybe in a subset of individuals across, you can reconstruct that by understanding what they do in, in plotting space. <coughs> so this is what we set out to do. We uh, obtain the entire uh, human protein interaction. <laughs> so the protein-protein interaction network, which has been experimentally determined, and then we <coughs> overlap the uh, statistical evidence of association with the physical evidence of interaction. And we try to detect subnetworks of this large network that are enriched in associated genes. <coughs> Does that make sense? A little bit? So uh, we published this a few years ago, and we did this with a very, very large GWAS, 15,000 cases and 30,000 controls. And this is the Manhattan plot uh, turn uh, on its side. There were a lot of genes that actually were discovered by this approach, but we said, okay, how about if we apply this method, can we discover even more genes? Because some of them would be below that magical threshold. And what we did here is uh, we computed, this is the GWAS uh, that I'm talking about, and this is uh, a plot showing how many edges in a network. Are you familiar with uh, uh, the terminology of uh, graph uh, network? So a network is composed of nodes and edges. So what we are detecting here is a network of about 800 proteins that are connected by about 400 edges. And this is way more than what would be expected by chance. So this is the 95th percentile of permutations done in the same network, if what happens if you draw 800 nodes from the same network at random and you count the number of connections? So this is the 95th percentile of that. So what we're saying is that this, this study resulted 
in additional discoveries if you do this approach. In contrast, we compare to many other studies that were much, much smaller, and they are not really enriched, except for this one. All the others fall within what would be expected by chance, so that means this is not a magic method. It may work if your GWAS is powered, uh, if your study is powered to do that. So this is uh, how the module search was uh, performed. Initially, like I mentioned, this is a subset, imagine, of the protein interactome, and we overlap the p-values of those genes being associated with the disease. Um, so initially, we convert all the p-values into z-scores using the inverse uh, normal distribution, and then we computed an aggregate score for the uh, network that appears to be, uh, so the subnetwork that is significant in all of them. So then this z sub a score is basically the, uh, the aggregate score of summing up all the significance in uh, z score space of the subnetwork and reporting that. Then we use that in a permutation to see how likely that score is able to uh, appear by chance. So this is a, uh, the intersection uh, net of uh, all the results that we obtain. All the genes that have a, uh, a yellow rim uh, here are genes that we knew were associated with the disease. However, there's a number of uh, other genes that were not known to be associated that were highlighted by this approach to be important. Of course, once you make any kind of, of discovery, you have to make sure that it doesn't stay in your computational analysis. You need to go back to the biology, back to the lab, and confirm that that is true. Anyone can make a prediction, but you need to see the facts. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we were lucky that after we predicted that, there was another study being performed uh, in which 14,000 cases were being analyzed in the same disease. So we were able to see how many of our predictions were actually found in this study that was uh, larger than us. And we were able to validate about 80% of our predictions. So that was, uh, that was fairly, fairly satisfying to see. So let me switch gears a little bit just to show um, one tool that we've developed um, to uh, study biological integration of data sets. And this is a tool that we call ICTNet or Integrated Complex Traits Networks. And this is a, um, uh, an app or a plugin for an open source uh, a network analysis program called Cytoscape. If you're not familiar with Cytoscape and you're interested in networks, even social networks, this is a great tool. Um, Cytoscape um, is an open source modular and extensible uh, framework that people can contribute packages to, pretty much like R. And in this case, what we uh, contributed was a database containing uh, information from genetics, protein interactions, drug uh, um, uh, targets, and side effects of drugs, and a, a number of other um, databases. We put all that together into a meta database, and then we make it av available to the user to explore via Cytoscape. So this is the kind of data that um, uh, we uh, downloaded from publicly available databases. <laughs> Again, so there's 22 different node types and 24 different types of edge, edges. So now this becomes a little bit uh, complicated if you want to do any kind of analysis in a network like this. If you're familiar with uh, uh, network theory, you may know that if you want to analyze the properties, the mathematical properties of a graph in which all the nodes are of the same type, then there's a pretty good chance that you can identify whether that network follows a particularly interesting uh, degree distribution. You see how it clusters. So there's a <coughs> lot of mathematical tools that have been developed to analyze graphs that are homogeneous. 
So where all the nodes are of the same type, whether that be proteins, airports, or computers. So you can see that, for example, the, the internet has a diameter of 19 clicks, uh, or the human uh, acquaintances network has a six degree of separation. That's a famous one. So, but all that is because all the nodes in that network are of the same type. And there's a great deal of, of, of math that I have been developed to understand whether the net, net networks are scale free or they're randomly connected. If they're scale free, you can uh, infer a number of properties. For example, there's robustness to uh, uh, random targeting of the nodes. So for example, uh, the airport network is fairly robust to uh, this function of one random airport. So if, if one random airport gets offline, well, nothing will happen to the global uh, flight industry. However, these kind of networks are a lot more sensitive to targeted attacks. If you disrupt operations at Chicago Hair, then it will be a huge deal of disturbance. Now, all that is possible because, again, those are homogeneous networks. When you are dealing with a network that has 22 different node types, that becomes really uh, difficult to apply all those uh, parameters because they don't really work. So this is a metagraph of uh, our network. We have data of different kinds uh, and these are the relationships that we can uh, infer for uh, all of those data sets. For example, we have the gene protein uh, uh, database here and there, uh, the self loop means that there's protein protein interactions in here. Then the, the genes to the microRNAs, microRNAs are a kind of regulatory molecules. Then you have what uh, genes are turned on and off in different cell types or in different tissues. Here you have the drug to, to disease network, the, the drug to disease relationships, the drug to side effects, and so on. So to analyze this kind of network and, uh, and ask questions of biological interest, we turn to actual so so social sciences. And we found that there was a method called link prediction that enabled us to navigate this complicated uh, topology into getting uh, information of how that network behaves and how information flows from one end to the other of the network and whether we can answer uh, specific health related questions. So the link prediction method uh, is, uh, embraces uh, network heterogeneity, which is one of the pluses. It's scalable. So you can start with small network and you can grow it to millions of nodes. Uh, it's amenable for supervised learning. So you can identify several features in that network that you see that are uh, at the univariate level might hold some predictive potential and then you can feed them into a machine learning approach method where you can uh, test the, uh, the predictiveness of, of that uh, feature or, or sets of features. And it's highly interpretable because you know which type of features you're including in your model. So um, the first thing that we do is we, uh, we define the topological feature between a source gene and a target. In this case, uh, a source of the target could be anything that you like in, and that you have in your network. In this case, we started by saying, well, we want to see what is the whether we can predict if a gene is associated to a disease, given that we have information about tissues, drugs, genetics, uh, biochemistry. So can that ensemble of data uh, help us predict in the absence of any study, what is the probability that that given source gene is involved in that target disease? So then we compute all the possible features. So we, we navigate, the, wa the we walk the network and compute how many paths lead, us, uh, lead from, from our uh, source to our target. And then uh, we incorporate those uh, potentially predictive paths into a, uh, a logistic regression or a lasso uh, model to um, see how predictive that is. And let me take you to an example. So this is the meta graph, again, where 
uh, we're going to be taking into account genes, uh, tissues, diseases, and then a number of annotations of those genes, so the functions of those genes. And then uh, when I refer to a feature, a feature here describes the prevalence of a specific type of path, what we call a metapath here, uh, that connects a given gene to a given disease. So in this particular example, the question is, is the R IRF1 gene associated with the disease? This is, I'm interested in multiple sclerosis again. The question is, is there a path from here to here? We know that there's no association that describes that. There's no experiment that has described that there is an association. I want to know if by navigating the network, I can get from here to here. And well, here I count all the possible paths from this gene to this disease. So I can go uh, from IRFR1 to leukocytes because this gene is expressed in this uh, type of cell. And I know that this type of cell is involved in the pathogenesis of this disease. So there's a one path here. And then there's three paths uh, in this type of, uh, uh, of structure. So go from protein to protein to disease. So this gene interacts in protein space with three others that are also known to be associated. So this is my uh, feature uh, space, if you wish. And then for this, I can compute what is called uh, uh, the, the path degree product. Uh, and essentially, this is just um, counting how many paths there are from here to here and taking into account how connected each of these nodes are in the, in the, in the network. So then I weight down highly connected nodes because just by, by, by sheer numbers, it's a path is more likely to go through those highly connected nodes. So then we call this the degree weighted path count because we're weighting down a particular uh, node if it's highly connected. So then we select those potentially predicted paths into a, uh, a machine learning method. In this case, we use lasso uh, or logistic rate rich regression uh, method. We set, like in uh, many other uh, machine learning approaches, we set our set of positives. This came from data of 152 additional studies. And uh, our negatives was a random set of associations in the network. So anything that we knew it was not associated we consider that to be the negative uh, set. So, and then we computed what is our ability to recall, again, those known associations from the, uh, from the paths. And we did fairly well in terms of, of predicting which are uh, these 452 known associations in our, in our network. There's not appreciable uh, uh, degradation in performance between the training and, and test. And uh, this resulted in, so this is a precision recall curve that you may be familiar with. This essentially, uh, at, at the sweet spot, can identify 21% precision at 10% recall. So this initially may seem fairly uh, poor based on other metrics. Well, of course we want to have 99% precision and 99% recall. However, remember that this is coming from a null uh, hypothesis that every single gene could be associated with every single disease. So if, if you compute the, the, the null, this is already a 20-fold enrichment over the null. And we're not doing any experiment. This is all computational yet. So even at this fairly uh, modest uh, precision and recall, we are lifting the prior probability of a given gene about 20-fold uh, over, 200-fold over um, uh, the, the uh, null. So here, um, one could see the composition of the different types of paths and how much do they contribute to the final performance of the, of the model. <laughs> by ju judging by the area under the curve. So you can see that a lot of this uh, meta paths don't add substantially, and a few of them add quite a bit. So at the, when you put them all together, you see that there's uh, a fairly um, healthy 
contribution to the uh, overall performance of the model. So these are sorted by, by contribution from the most to the least. And again, in this case, we, uh, our predictions uh, of, of genes being associated with a given disease were, um, were um, fairly good in uh, the, our ability to predict 27 novel uh, genes. And we actually were able uh, to validate four out of five of those. So we tested ex specifically five, and we were able to validate four of them. So with this, we put together a, a database for every disease, every gene, and what is the probability based on the known network or the known uh, data, what is the uh, basic probability that that gene is involved in that disease? And whenever you find your disease of interest, you click on the gene of interest and it tells you from which path that information is coming. So you can see that here it goes from gene uh, associated to disease, which is associated to another gene, which is associated to another disease. So these are two genes that are associated with the, one gene that is associated with two diseases, then if, if there's a gene that interacts with that gene, it's likely to be also associated with the same two diseases. So in this case, uh, I would like to make the, 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 the claim that data integration is a valid strategy to discover new hypotheses. And of course, they need to be tested. But heterogeneous network analysis here is, is, is a promising tool to discover hidden patterns that might have biological implications. And, and importantly, not all genes are a priori equally likely to be associated with a human disease. And you can use, again, information from the rest <coughs> of the uh, data ensemble. So in the last uh, few minutes, I would like to show you another example of this. Uh, and this goes into the field of drug repurposing. Drug repurposing is, is a very hot topic because as you may know, developing a new drug from an initial compound may take 15 years and more than a billion dollars to develop. And actually, the success rate of that is about 1%. So 99 out of the uh, 100 compounds that get tested fail. And what we're trying to do is, well, there's are, are already 1,500 molecules that are approved by the FDA, by the Federal Drug Administration, to be safe and to be effective for particular diseases. But no one says that those very same compounds may not be also repurposed for another disease. And this has to do with our inability to rationally develop drugs based on what we know in biology. Most of the drugs that are being developed are used, are, uh, follow a, a different path, which is highly parallel assays trying to identify a molecule that does something that we hope it will be important for the disease, but we don't know. So there are many examples of repurposing of drugs. Uh, the most famous perhaps is Viagra that originally was developed for something else and it ended up being used 10 times more frequently for something else. So it is uh, still a very uh, um, important uh, field of research, if you could repurpose some drug that has already been used for something, then you can save a lot of money and time and help a lot of people. So again, big data is everywhere. Uh, we talked about this. Uh, we have electronic medical records in the millions now. Uh, of course, we have publicly available data sets. Uh, and can we leverage all that in, in order to inform better candidates for drug repurposing. So where do we start? The hypothesis here is that similarly to what we described with genes and diseases, does every drug have the same potential to treat every condition? Well, uh, this needs some, some diligence, but also luck. And, and again, a lot of the drugs that have been developed into effective therapies owe more uh, to serendipity than to, to careful design. 
But the, the, the question that we're posing here is, can every drug be systematically <laughs> repurposed for something else? So, well, that will take a lot of testing. So that will take 1,500 drugs to be tested in more than 200 diseases. And you cannot possibly run clinical trials in all those combinations, right? But imagine that uh, in dreamland, uh, you can do that. Well, maybe through informatics, one can do that. So imagine that there's a, a, a condition, in this case, migraine, and we can pull out all the data that we know that drugs that treat migraine, okay? So we're gonna zoom out now, and we're gonna enter into the stage all the drugs that are known to treat migraine. And now we're further zooming out, and we're including, so these are, uh, as you can see, red edges, those are drugs that treat the actual disease, and uh, now we're gonna add edges that also are uh, symptomatic for that disease. So aspirin may not treat cancer, but sometimes treats the headaches of cancer. And now we put together all 136 complex diseases and the treatments for them, all FDA approved drugs. So this is a database that we put together uh, and we're representing this in the format of a graph. So these are all the drugs that actually are used today to treat all of these diseases. Now, let's keep zooming out because this is gonna get busy. <coughs> Can we uh, add additional information to this network? And can we predict back if we delete these relationships <coughs> that we know are true based on how we navigate the network? So that's the same concept that I showed you with the genes and diseases, now with drugs. So now we enter genes into this equation. We put small molecules, target genes to modify their function. That's how drugs work. But genes are also uh, uh, modifying our risk to develop diseases. So we can start connecting this graph in this way. We know that uh, the genes exert a function in the cell. We know that genes have uh, particular uh, places where they live. We know that they act in, on particular pathways. We know that some genes are expressed in some tissues and in some cells, but not all of them in all. We know that most diseases have a tissue target associated with them, so that's this information. We know that diseases have a, a number of symptoms that are associated to them. We know that small molecules produce, unfortunately, side effects. So the question is, can we predict back, again, this uh, relationships that we deleted from the beginning by navigating the work, the network backwards. And we use, so this is a summary of the network. And again, uh, this we, we call HetioNet uh, for heterogeneous uh, uh, network version 1.0. This network has more than 2.2 million relationships mm -hmm. of 24 different types. Similarly to what I showed you in the genes, we extracted features from the network uh, to quantify what the prevalence of a specific path is. The total number of possible paths is close to 47 million. And we fitted a regularized regression model to go from network-based features to a probability that a given treatment will treat a given disease. And then we permuted <coughs> the network, again, because you have to make, you have to make sure that your data is uh, true in the uh, background of uh, chance, we permuted the network several times to see what our predictability is on a permuted network, meaning a network that has relationships that don't make biological sense. So this uh, chart here shows, again, the features that are the most predictive above uh, permutation. And this is our top predictions. So for example, we identified that the drug called pamidronate will treat osteoporosis. Well, that's good news because that's actually a known treatment. So those are one of the links that we were able to retrieve. And it, you can see that there's a lot on the top predictions, there's a lot of drugs that are disease modifying already. However, some of them are not. So ibandronate, we predicted with a fairly high uh, probability that it will treat uh, this disease but it's not a known uh, treatment yet. So this is something that we will prioritize for further analysis, and this is the objective of this uh, approach. So on, 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 on aggregate, you see that most of our top predictions are already treatments. 
So this is the, the top uh, 25th percentile of, of the predictions is uh, enriched in known drugs, uh, in known drug diseases relationships. And if we uh, compute what is our uh, uh, predictability of retrieving those known treatments is fairly high. Even though if we change which database we use to identify known treatments, uh, we get a fairly good prediction. And even though if we use clinical trials, this is a database maintained by the FDA, where every single drug that has ever been tested in a, in a human trial is listed here. The caveat here is that that trial may have failed. So the fact that it was tested doesn't mean that it was uh, successful. So, but even by these standards, uh, we're doing fairly well in identifying those drugs. So the point is that um, this is a, a valid method to prioritize using additional information to prioritize the probability that a given drug might treat a disease. And the way we've uh, been doing this, this large database that contains millions of interactions, uh, it will perform fairly poorly if we use the, a typical relational database approach because uh, the queries will take an extremely long time. So we turn into uh, a um, uh, graph database instead. It's a graph called Neo4j. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, networks can be uh, explored in a, a script language called Cypher, and it is fairly easy to, uh, it's a pretty, pretty structured language that you can identify a particular node of interest, and you can pick your relationship, and you can set your uh, conditions, and then you can get, for example, which are all the nodes that connect, uh, uh, that sh are shared between the disease multiple sclerosis and psoriasis. It only takes three lines of code. So you can extract this portion of the network from millions of interactions. <coughs> Another example, if I wanted to see what are all the compounds that target MS-associated genes, then it takes, again, four lines of code, and you get returned the disease, the genes that are associated with the disease, and the compounds that target those genes. So this, again, is very, very effective uh, for very quick searches and very quick uh, returns. So now we're working on refining this method, trying to add additional molecules, additional relationships, adding patient-specific data from the millions of electronic and medical records that we have available. Uh, potentially incorporating prior proprietary knowledge from pharmaceutical companies if they're interested in this approach, some of them are. Uh, we're planning of adding metagenomics data, so the genomes of, of microbes. Uh, and of course, going back to the bench, test our predictions. It's important uh, in a field like, uh, like, like this to make predictions, but it's even more important to be able to validate them. So this is very much work in progress. I would like to uh, thank all the people in the lab that contributed to this work. We do a ski trip every year. Uh, it's uh, half fun, half work. Uh, we do lab meetings uh, up in the mountain. Uh, but it's uh, a lot of fun working with these people. And thank you very much. I think I'm on time. Yeah, absolutely. So we see that, for example, genes that are associated with uh, immunologically, uh, uh, immunological diseases are all involved in pathways that have to do with a cell, uh, an immune cell presenting the antigen uh, to a T cell or to a B cell. So they're all involved in pathways that have to do with the pathogenesis of the disease that we're considering. So again, this informs a lot about the biology. So you, you get your candidates and you have to, to see, you, you can learn. In MS, for example, there's a big, big question. Multiple sclerosis is an immune disease, so our, our, immune, our, our immune system targets our own cells, 
of the central nervous system. So that the target is, is the myelin that ensheathes uh, the, the neurons in the brain. We don't know yet whether the susceptibility comes all from the immune component or from the central nervous system component. So these kind of approaches are telling us uh, more about that. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of things will come, will, will need to come to the rescue of biology. Biology, for the longest time, has taken a, a reductionistic approach. And uh, in hindsight, this was the only way that we could start understanding the, the, how biology worked, makes sense, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. Because it, biological organisms were just too complex to, to analyze all at once. So we had to divide in smaller pieces and let's try to identify the little pieces and hopefully we'll put it back together. Problem is that we never got to that part. And now there's a lot of data being made available, mm -hmm. quantitative data. And now we're starting to put together methods from social sciences, physics, computer science, and everything can contribute to understanding this very, very complex system that is a biological organism.